Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Entertainment Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am, as always, delighted to be with you to bring you another author interview. Uh, As we get started with the show, um, if you have not done so already, I invite you to please like and subscribe on whatever platform you are listening and or watching this podcast on. That really does help us out in terms of Um, getting this podcast out to more listeners and viewers such as yourselves. Also, uh, at this point, I'd like to remind you that if you are a fan of this podcast and you would like to support this podcast in any way, you see the graphic next to me telling you that you can go to gsmcpodcast.info. You can leave a tip or a donation, and that also helps the show a lot. Uh, There's also... um, Oh, I was was about to say there's also that really long link, but that link has been updated. So now both of the places that you're seeing the link say gsmcpodcast.info. Again, if you are interested in supporting the show in any way, uh, in this way, uh, by leaving a tip or donation, you are welcome to do so. And I would thank you in advance for that. I thank you in advance and in the present for all of the support that you give this podcast, whether you have been listening to the audio podcast for years, whether you're just now finding the video podcast, I really, really appreciate all of my listeners and followers and supporters. So thank you. I have a great show for you today, a great interview for you today. I am interviewing author Katrina Kittle about her newest novel, Morning in This Broken World. Um, Before we get to the interview, though, how are you doing? I like to check in with you and see how you're doing. And, uh, you know, always feel free to leave me a comment and tell me how your day is going, how your week is going, etc. My week is going okay. It's been fairly busy. Last week was... um, busy with birthday, my oldest niece's birthday, and did I mention that my oldest niece recently had a baby? I cannot remember if I've mentioned that on the podcast, but I am a great auntie, and she had a baby the first part of February. I can't believe he's almost two months old already, Um, but her birthday was on Friday, which was also Good Friday if you um, celebrate Easter and Holy Week and those sorts of things. And then Sunday, of course, was Easter. Um, Whether you celebrate that religiously or secularly or not at all, maybe you just celebrate by eating lots and lots of Easter chocolate. I completely support that. Um, Yesterday was my brother's birthday. He is four years and 11 days older than I am. Yes, I like to make sure he knows that it's four years and 11 days older than I am. And then today, um, less fun is the second anniversary of my father's death and i know that as usual i've got the crazy lighting so you can't really i'm act, i'm glad that you can't quite see how blotchy i am today because there have been a few crying jags today already um and that's okay got extra hugs from my husband and some good snuggles from my dogs that help and i'm just i'm thinking about my dad today so much and remembering him and missing him I, he was a librarian. I've mentioned that before. He was a K-12 librarian uh, for most of my life. When I first started kindergarten uh, up to about second grade, he was also the music teacher. He was my music teacher. And in kindergarten, my parents said, you know, your dad's a teacher. You need to address him as Mr. Meckler when he comes to teach music in in your class. And uh I was an incredibly stubborn child, and I said, nah, that doesn't work for me. And so my entire kindergarten class called him Mr. Daddy. (laughs) I don't know. Apparently, my five-year-old brain thought that was a good compromise. I was still addressing him as Mr., right? Respect. Um, But he was the K-12 librarian and definitely had an influence on my love of reading, both he and my mother. My mother is a voracious reader. She reads constantly. And um, I love talking to both of them about books. They have very different tastes. Uh, My dad loved everything fantasy. He read also like Clive Cussler type books. um, But 
I'd say 90% of his reading was fantasy series. And he'd get so mad. He would get so mad because, you know, you'd read a book and then you'd have to wait a year until the next one came out. And then you'd have to remember what happened in the book that came out a year ago that was 500, 600 pages. <laughs> and uh, he and my brother always had this list of, of fantasy authors they were going to go smack because they, <laughs> they were annoyed with the series not being done yet. But, um, oh, I miss my dad. Anyway. So it's it's a bittersweet day. I, I I love remembering the good stories, but I I miss him all the time. I miss talking to him about books and music and everything else. We used to watch the same movie movies together over and over, and we would quote them. And um, yeah, I just I I miss him so much. But thank you for letting me share a little bit about my dad with you. Uh, let's let's talk about the book that we are going to share today. I am speaking, as I said, with author Katrina Kittle. And give me a second as I set up the graphic. I, there we go. Um, still getting the hang of everything, but I, I think I'm starting to get a little bit better. I'm, I'm trying to just relax and go with it and let you know that there's always going to be some some issues. So as you can see by the graphic next to me and the title underneath, uh, this is Morning in this Broken World. The author is Katrina Kittle. And here is the description of the book. Grieving but feisty widow, Vivian Laurent is, a, is at a late in life crossroads. The man she loved is gone. Their only daughter is estranged and missing. And the assisted living facility where her husband died is going into quarantine. Living in lockdown with only heartache and memories is something Vivian can't bear. Then comes a saving grace. Luna, a compassionate nursing assistant and newly separated mother, is facing eviction. Vivian has a plan that could turn their lives around, return to her old home and invite Luna and her two children to move in with her. With the exuberant 11-year-old Wren in her hot pink motorized wheelchair and Wren's troubled older brother, Cooper, the new housemates make for an unlikely pandemic pack weathering the coming storm together. Now, it's time to heal old wounds, make peace with the past, find hope and joy, and discover that the strongest bonds can get anyone through the worst of times. And so, uh, yeah, as I said, that is the description of Morning in This Broken World. The author, again, as you can see on the screen next to me, is Katrina Kittle. And I loved, loved, loved this book so much. I sped through it. It is written so beautifully. It was that there were some hard things for me to read that, you know, it takes place. I did a TikTok about it and it takes place. It starts in March of 2020. And if you remember what we were doing in March of 2020, it was a lot of confusion and a lot of um, toilet paper hoarding <laughs> and various different things, you know, a lot of now nah, this will be over in two weeks and just we're still figuring it out, right? So that brought up a lot of different memories. Um, the there's some there's there's a lot there's a lot of different layers. All the characters uh, are wonderfully complex characters, and they have different things going on in their lives. And there were a few things that were um, a bit triggering for me as a reader, and that's okay. But the the main point is that I loved this book so much and I really enjoyed speaking to Katrina about it. Um, I loved the characters. I loved the way she developed the characters. Even the secondary characters brought a lot to the story and were so beautifully drawn out. Um, but again, let's go ahead and turn to the interview so that you can listen to Katrina talk about the book and not me. Um, once again, I've said it a million times, but I'm going to keep saying it a million times more. The book is Morning in This Broken World. The author is Katrina. Katrina Kittle. Hi, Katrina. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm very excited to have you here. We're going to talk about your novel, um, Morning in This Broken World. But before we do that, if you would just take a few moments to share a little bit about yourself, let my listeners get to know you a bit, that would be great. Absolutely. Yes. So um, I am a novelist. I have six novels in the world. This is my sixth, so I'm very, very proud of that. And I teach a lot of creative writing. Um, I'm a lecturer in creative writing at the University of Dayton. I live in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and I have also been teaching for almost 20 years for a group called Wordsworth Writing Connections that's just um, 
creative writing classes for adults, all different kinds. And I'm not their only teacher, but I'm kind of their primary teacher. And so that's always fun. And during the pandemic, we finally went online. So we were mostly teaching to people in the Cincinnati, Columbus, Dayton area. And now, now we're online. So that's really fun. Um, I do a lot of public speaking. I, I talk obviously a lot about writing for different conferences and workshops. Coming up is the, one, the Irma Bombeck Writers Workshop, which is one of my very favorites. So I'm back on faculty for them. But I also do what I like to call my um, life classes, where I do a lot of public speaking on, um, I have a happy class, which is kind of my brand, <laughs> and um, uh, a class called Leap and the Net Will Appear, which is about creating positive change in your life. So I adore teaching those. Um, I was an actress. I still do a lot of community theater work. Um, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. So, and that really influenced, I think, Morning in This Broken World. I love gardening. I love baking. I love animals. And I'm addicted to coffee, which I have right here. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am drinking tea today, but normally it, often it is coffee. It just depends on the day. <laughs> um, a couple of things from your your intro. So my husband and I often have conversations of, does anybody even know who that, who that is anymore? And when he said Irma Bombeck, I'm like, I wonder how many of my nieces age, you know, in that yeah. in the Gen Z, I wonder if they know that name. It's... I hope so. She was such a trailblazer for any of us who are writing now, especially women. So um, I love her. And this conference is one of my very favorites. She was, she was amazing. So, um, the title of the book, again, is Warning in This Broken World. Uh, can you give an overview of the story? Yes. Um, so the bottom line is that it's a story of a very unlikely pandemic pack coming together, kind of forming a found family. And through their coming together, they're all able to kind of let go of this armor they all were, had, these walls they'd sort of built around themselves. Some of them knew it, some of them didn't and kind of emerge as their more authentic selves by the end of the story. Um, so a little more specifically, we've got four point of view characters and we start with Vivian, who's a recent widow. She's li still living in the um, retirement community where her husband passed away. He had dementia for a long time. They still own their previous home, but she's afraid, she's trying to return to it. Just feels really haunted to her with memories and she's, very unhappy, grieving. And it's not a spoiler because it happens on the very first page. She's actually considering like not being here anymore, yes. ending her life to return to be with her husband, feeling she is nothing's worth it, nothing to live for. And um, her very favorite nursing assistant who cared for her husband arrives. Her name is Luna. So she's the she's another one of the point of view characters. And through a series of events, Vivian learns that Luna is newly separated and about to be evicted. And so she's kind of forms this plan of like, this is, I can help her and you guys can return to my house and maybe like live with me. And she knows that Luna has a, um, a daughter named Ren, who she adores. He's 11 years old. She's in a hot pink motorized wheelchair. She has cerebral palsy, but she didn't know that Luna also has a 15 year old son, Cooper, who's always very angry and in a lot of trouble. But these four end up fleeing the day of lockdown. Um, and moving into Vivian's house together, where I, like I said, they make a very unlikely pack, but um, kind of become this family and they all sort of needed each other and didn't even realize it. Yeah. Now this is a compliment. So, but it's going to, it's going to come off not nice at first because I'm very mad at you. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'm not mad at you. <laughs> I am mad at you because your writing is so good, but you, it, I think it was too soon for a, a pandemic novel, apparently, because I'm reading this and you are just capturing so many things, words that I had, that I remembered, but, uh, you know, you, you kind of like mask me, hadn't thought about mask me in forever. This, the, <laughs> you know, the, the panic, the panic buying of toilet paper, the, the, the pot, your pod, it, you, you captured so much of that so well. So it's a compliment. Your writing is amazing in that. But at the same time, I was like, Oof, was not ready to go back to that level <laughs> of 2020. Um, yes, thanks. And I do want to say, I should have said this in the overview, where COVID is the catalyst for the story for these people coming together, but if it's not the focus of the whole story. So it's not, it stops being a COVID story, I think, and becomes very much about this family instead. But that's what brings them together to start with. 
Yes. So if you're like, I don't know if I want to focus on the pandemic, it's not really a pandemic novel. Right. right. <laughs> then, um, just be prepared to have some memories come up that you're like, <laughs> yeah, block that for a reason. <laughs> um, what was your initial inspiration for the book? Some people are surprised to learn I started working on these characters in 2019. Um, so the initial inspiration was an NPR story that was about um, all these programs, some here in the US, but mostly in Europe, that are combining uh, elder care with child care. Yeah. And not just putting them in the same buildings, but actually integrating programs. And it struck me, I'm like, I, I was, it was one of those driveway moments where you, you reach your destination, but you're sitting in the car so you can hear the end of the story. And I'm like, I want to write an intergenerational friendship story. That's my next book. And I have written many interspecies friendships. There's, those are in all of my books, including this one. But um, I'm like, I've never really done an intergenerational friendship story. So I started working. And initially, I had Vivian and Cooper in my head. And, but I, could, I was trying to figure out what brings them together. How would they meet each other? And I was just kind of noodling around, which is how I typically start when the pandemic actually happened. And I was like, not to trivialize how horrible it was for so many people, but for this story, it was kind of a happy accident of like, oh, this is what brings them together. Right. You know, this is um, just kind of using it, this thing that was happening. And um, then the other inspiration of how I found some of the other characters and what would happen is here in Ohio, our, our governor, Mike DeWine, would do this thing everybody jokingly called wine with DeWine during lock those lockdown days where he, every afternoon he'd do a press conference and you could tune into it on the public radio and um, he'd give us the updates, whatever. And so I'd usually, you know, my school had gone online, so I was home gardening <laughs> and I'd have my phone playing the radio in pocket of my overalls and I would listen to wine with DeWine and he would end almost every one of those in the early days saying, we're in this together, we're all in the same boat. And very quickly, there were memes circulating on social media saying, we are not all in the same boat. We are in the same storm, but some of us have canoes and some of us have yachts and some of us are drowning. And that was the next big inspiration where I'm like, okay, here's my pandemic experience, which is pretty easy. Um, my job was not in jeopardy. For a writer to be told to stay home, it's kind of a blessing, right? You're like... But I know, like, I was deeply worried about my father, who was in a retirement community. Um, thank God he's a reader, loves to read. So he had things to do, but we couldn't see him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would call him every day. So I'm like, there's a boat, this, this horror. And we had lost my mom in January of 2020. So he was newly widowed and, new, you know, newly single, yeah. I guess. Um, yeah still grieving and that combination of grieving and isolation really helped me shape Vivian. But then I started thinking about what are the other boats people are in? A really dear friend of mine named Dara has cerebral palsy. And I knew from talking with her that her pandemic experience was horrible because she has to fight so hard for her world not to be so small anyway, being a person in a wheelchair. But she typically has occupational therapy, physical therapy, a couple times a week. And all of those were canceled. You couldn't be in person. So her therapists were trying to work with her through video on their phones and her family members were trying to be her therapists. And, and I was like, okay, so there's another boat. And then just the idea of what school children were going through, like some mm -hmm. students like Rin, that was their social network and they hated missing it. But there were lots of students who thrived yeah. not being a part of the bullying and the harassment, the clickiness that so many people encounter. And so that's where Cooper's experience came in, where he was thrilled to be away from those people, you know? Yeah. So I was just trying to like collect and Luna, of course, with, you know, all these essential workers who don't get paid nearly enough. She's a nursing assistant. They were considered essential. And yet in those early days before we knew what we were really dealing with, you know, they were risking their lives and, and they're so undervalued as far as pay goes. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just trying to find all the boats I could to fill out my cast. That was another inspiration. Yeah. Um, and there's a, the poem at the beginning um, and I, it, it's something with cicadas and I can't think of the title. I should have written it down. I apologize, but I remember <laughs> reading that on Facebook when, and so when oh, I, cool. I started the book and I'm like, you, you know, when you have that moment of, have I read this? Is this, you know, like you have, to, yeah. you have to go into your memory. So was, did you find that in the process of writing or was it part of your inspiration? Yes. 
Yes. And so that's called, this is how a pandemic ends, not with a bang, but with cicadas. <laughs> so depending on where you are in the world, you know, the 17 year cicadas, they're called the brood X. Um, they were emerging here in Ohio and several other places um, in, the, in that June of 21. Because <laughs> of course, and, um, I mean, I, right, of course, right, what's next? You know, we have the plague, we have the locust, frogs are going to start falling from the sky. But um, so I'm friends with Kathleen McCleary, who wrote that poem. She's a beautiful novelist. And you know how people had their pandemic projects? Like some people would do their sourdough starters mm -hmm. and some people learned to knit. She started writing poetry and she would post it on Facebook. Um, and she was just playing around with poems. And when I saw that, it like I was about three fourths of the way through the draft and it was reading the poem made me go, OK, that's where we're heading. That's what, um, do you care if I, can I read the poem? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, I put on my reading glasses. <laughs> I, guess I love that poem so much, but this unlocks the end of the book for me. Um, so it's very short. It's uh, so it goes, we went underground this year, like the cicadas burrowed deep, huddled against roots, sucking what little sustenance we could from whatever we found. The cicadas sing outside my window now. And I swear the other sound I hear is the crackling of millions of exoskeletons, the shells we grew to harden ourselves against our longing to be touched. And it's those last two lines that got me, right? Yes. Because all four of my point of view characters already had these shells, just like the cicadas did. And, um, they, and some of them were very conscious about building those shells, that armor, and some of them didn't realize they were doing it. but it's through coming together, they were able to crack those and leave them behind, kind of like the cicadas. So it was kind of perfect to be like, okay, that's the end point of the story. And that's the image I'm fighting for. That's the image of like this idea of discarding their shells and emerging as their more authentic selves. So, and like the cicadas, they get a little loud, get a little dramatic. <laughs> and, um, but, but you, you know, they're able to like be who they're supposed to be. Yeah. So first, keep in mind the people who were just behind me in that last clip, because they're going to appear shortly into the next segment. But um, I really like that poem that Katrina read, and uh, I love how it influenced the end of the book. But I was actually amazed because I I read that poem on Facebook. I don't remember when, but I, um, I'm surprised, one, that I didn't just scroll past it, you know, when you get to doom scrolling or just regular scrolling sometimes you you don't pay attention but i saw it i read it i really liked it um i just i like all of the imagery that it evokes so uh like that it was something that I'd, I'd actually read when i opened the book and started reading it um and like just like the poem in general but we're going to take our first break of the podcast when we come back again keep those people in mind <laughs> just for something silly and then we're going to be talking about those four main characters vivian Ren, Cooper, and Luna, and what about each of them you as readers might resonate with. So stay tuned. You are watching and or listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's going to be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet, damn, ain't that great nice. I don't wanna go to work, cause my boss is a jerk, and I'm not even that paid I need a change in my life, cause I don't feel alive, and there's nothing that makes me happy Oh, Hold my beer for a minute, I'm about to quit my job, cash in for a ticket I'm going on a trip, and I don't plan to visit I'm gonna stay there till I feel like I'm winning, oh And this is just the beginning, I need a big change, help me feel like living I need a big swing, home runs I'm hitting, and I'll never look back Moving on till I get it all And we all got dreams We all want things But what you gonna do for it? How you gonna move for it? What you gonna be? And do you believe You can do anything Hell from there Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Katrina Kittle Before the break we were talking about the poem um, The the, the poem that I once again blanked out on the name of something about cicadas. Uh, this is how, this is how a pandemic ends. Yes, uh, with cicadas. But um, that, that's terrible. I just butchered that. Bear with me. I got flustered. 
anyway, we were talking about that poem and now welcome back and we, let's go ahead and return to the interview with Katrina Kittle. So let's let's talk a little bit more about each of them. Um, there, again, there's four points of view um, and each from third person. So you, it, it, I think it would maybe get a little confusing if you tried it any other way um, yeah. with each chapter starting with their names, you know, who we've got. Um, we've got somebody taking a picture of our window behind me. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's weird a, a couple minutes ago they were looking through I like that um I, I try to ignore people behind me but sometimes you're <laughs> like what? um so can you talk a little bit more about each of those characters and um because I think they're going to resonate with different readers um so what about them might resonate okay yeah well I think just quickly all four of them I think what they share in common that people might relate to is all four of them at the start of the story are feeling in different ways, kind of invisible, and just really hungry to be seen for who they are and what they need. Um, so Vivian is 75, and I've had a lot of readers write to me about how they loved seeing what they call senior representation, <laughs> where it's like, there is lots of women have written to me and be like, there are never women my age in stories, and she gets to be the heroine, and she's pretty badass. And she swears, um, like, she's got a little oh. a foul mouth, like, she's not this, sometimes you picture 75-year-olds as these little prim, like, we, we, little we lady. <laughs> almost dehumanize them a little bit sometimes, yeah. because we, you know, so. Yeah. yeah, she's got a, she's got a foul mouth. Actually, the publisher had to put, I hope it's okay to say this. <laughs> Can I say swear words? Um, you can allude to it. <laughs> okay. They put a um, bleepometer on me and said I needed to cut back on some of the worst okay. swear words. And it was funny because when I started doing the search, um, it, they were mostly Vivian's, not Cooper's. You would think that would all be coming from Cooper, but it was mostly Vivian. Vivian. Um, so yeah, she's um, she she's very, um, it, you know, she's just very forthright. She will get things done. Nothing embarrasses her. Um, she tells the truth, which Cooper really relates to. That's the basis of their friendship is that she tells the truth, but you know, she's, so even if you haven't lost someone, I think we've already, we could all relate to just being grieving something, a loss feeling. So, you know, feeling so sad that you feel like nothing's worth it or like, you know, just she, she'd really hit this low point. And what I love is that what brings her out of it is her recognizing she could help someone else. And then with Luna, the nursing assistant, she's got a special needs child. She's got another child who's frequently in trouble. She, I think a lot of women might relate to Luna in just this idea of like, we take care of everyone. When is it our turn, right? She's such the caretaker and she's so good at her job. But she, her wall, her kind of armor is that she will never ask for help. She can do it. She can do it. She's fine. She will always find the way. And so for her, just this idea of like, it's okay, to take a break. It's okay to accept help. Um, uh, Cooper, he's not so much, and I don't think this is a spoiler because I don't think it's a major plot point in the story, but he's not so much struggling with his sexual identity. He knows exactly who he is. What he's struggling with is how to be who he knows he is um, with his dad's disapproval. So even if your own sexual identity has never been an issue, I think we can all relate to wanting approval from someone or feeling judged by someone and how that can eat away at you. And then sweet little Rin, I just adore her. Um, hers, I think there is almost like the coming of age story. Um, but I love, you had a recent guest who said, we're all coming of age all the time. It just depends on what age we are. And I loved that, that really spoke to me. But with Rin, she's just kind of, rec kind of moving from this very childish, wishful thinking to kind of seeing some things for what they really are. She kind of had these I don't know, these kind of rosy view of her family life and her father in particular and how things worked in the world. And she's she kind of goes through a um, just kind of recognition of reality that I think a lot of us will relate to and how bittersweet that can be where you feel like you're growing up. But it's also like, oh, yeah. <laughs> this isn't as yeah. good as I thought. If with Ren, you can see it coming because she she has a little bit of um well, if it was a fantasy book or, or something, it'd be magical realism. You know, she really, yeah. she really wants magic and she wants to oh, wish yeah. things into being. And so as you're reading her, you're like, oh, sweet thing. You're just, you know, you're, you're going to, she's going to get stomped down in some way when she starts realizing yeah. that the world doesn't fully work like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So when it comes to characters, uh, you had Vivian and Cooper in mind when you started, but then 
how do you how do you do your character development? Do you like to have a really good character sketch before you start writing or let them develop as you write? It's a little bit of both. I do a lot of just playing with the characters first before I officially start the document called the novel on the computer. And I'll do a lot of that early character work by hand in just notebooks. Somehow it feels more free, like playing around, like you're just noodling. It's nothing official and it just makes you so free. Um, And so I have to figure out what they want and what are some things that'll be in their way before I feel comfortable um, saying, okay, I've got them. So once I know like, okay, here's what they're each, here's what they want. um, I can start that document, but then I'm also, it's really important to stay open to what they tell you along the way. And I remember before I started writing, I've always been a reader, always, always. And so I'd hear authors say stuff like that, like to see what they want to do or see what they come up, see what the characters come up with as I'm writing. And I'm like, you're the one writing it. You know, it always sounded so crazy. And now I tell, you know, obviously I get it now because in the process of especially a first draft, they do sort of take on a life of their own where of course you're the one controlling it, but just as in the act of writing these amazing discoveries happen. And they never happen when I'm out doing other things. It has to be in the act of writing where you're suddenly like, oh, this is what he wants. This is what he's going to do now. And he's going to, and he loves to bake and he loves to do this. And, you know, and all these things just come to you. Um, So I try to do that combination of like staying open to what they tell me. And I always jokingly, I love that Terry Pratchett quote that says the first draft is just you telling yourself the story. So I just try to be really open to anything that wants to be told and anything that's going to come to me in that in that first draft. How about secondary characters? Because there's four secondary characters that are very important, um, but they're not the focus. They don't have their own points of view, but they really move the plot forward in certain ways. Yeah. Um, do you spend as much time with character development on secondary characters or not as much? Yeah, well, it's maybe not quite as much, but a lot, an awful lot. So the the neighbors in particular, at one point in the early drafts, they were point of view characters. One of them was. Um, and I love those guys so much. <laughs> so it's, a, you know, it's a couple we all need those neighbors. Who, yeah, who lives next to Vivian, uh, Drew and Stephen. Um, and they have been to kind of take looking out for her house while she was with Jack in the um, when he had to go to memory care. Um, and so when she moves back, you know, they're there, they, they're kind of her, they look out for her, they adore her. So they were point of view characters at one point. And then I'm like, oh, it's too many. I want to focus on just who's in this house. Right. But I will play around with them. Um, Anne Marie, Vivian's estranged daughter. Okay. So my cat is now on the desk. Oh yeah. You see a tail. There we go. (laughs) If I see you on guard, she sometimes will rub her, that's what she's doing right now, rubbing her chin on the corner of the laptop. And one time during a podcast, she closed the laptop and (laughs) shut me off. So, so I'm on guard. I'm like, well, I will just say my dogs are here, but, and they, uh, I I can't believe they have not barked at anyone walking by. That's usually their MO, but so. So we'll see what she does. I think she's going to, she's just checking things out. Um, so yeah. So Anne Marie, Vivian's estranged daughter, uh, who deals with um, addiction. She, I did a lot of work on her um, and did a lot of writing of her. And I knew she, she wasn't going to be a point of view character, but I just felt really strongly I wanted to get her story right. And yeah. same with Cal, um, Vivian and, uh, no, sorry, Ren and Cooper's dad. So you're right. There are four, four point of view and four supporting who are like the, the central characters. I hadn't even thought of like four and four. It's a nice symmetry. Um, yes. So just claim it. Just pretend that was your plan all okay. along. <laughs> now on. And I'll always think of you, Sarah, and be like, <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, uh, now, you've mentioned several things that, that are of interest to you that are in the book, ba- baking, gardening, um, certain things like that. But were there other things that you brought in that you needed to research and and do a little more work on? Yes. Yes. So one of the most important to me was the cerebral palsy. Um, and I knew I had my my friend Dara to be a huge resource. Sorry, the cat tail is still <laughs> here. Come here. Show, um, show us your cute little kitty face. Here oh. she is. This is, this <laughs> is Anne. She's afraid of everything. She's the stereotypical scaredy cat. So will you go and mind your own business, please? My 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 boy dog thinks he's a German shepherd, but he's he's scared of snacks. Oh. Like, he's literally <laughs> scared of peanuts and beef jerky. That's hilarious. And I totally relate because the other day she was afraid of a sock on the floor. 
She would not approach it. She was all puffed up, circling around. And I'm like, it's a sock. So I get it. Peanuts sucks. The world is a very dangerous place. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, cerebral palsy. I'm sorry yes. for the interview. Um, so Dara was hugely helpful with that. And I just, I knew I needed to get that right. And she helped me with, she would read passages and talk with me, help, like, I met with her several times, kind of shadowed her through things. And she was very good at pointing out, okay, she wouldn't be able to do that on her own and other things where she's like, oh, she could totally do that on their own. So um, just making sure I had the timeline of what may have caused it, what her early life would be like, what was the progression what were her, how did it manifest in her? Cause it's not the same in everyone. Um, so that was a big eye opener. And my dad has a muscle disease. Um, it's a very, um, strain it's it's rare it's called sandhoff's disease not a lot of people know about it so i've always been it's always been on my radar to um I, I wanted to represent people with disabilities and he has the line my dad had the line that i gave to ren at one point where she's thinking like being in a wheelchair my dad's in a motorized scooter like you sometimes feel completely invisible people just look over you but you also feel so incredibly in the way you are an inconvenience to everybody, you know, so it's that conflicting yeah. thing of like, no one sees you and everybody sees you in the wrong way. Um, and just trying to capture that and make it and show it like how Cooper really looks out for her. He may seem like such a tough guy, but how he's so aware of what she needs and what she's not getting. And same with Luna and just trying to bring that awareness. And then also um, some of the research with the addiction and also then with um, just researching like the CDC timeline of, okay, what day, what week was it when they declared it a pandemic? And when did that eviction moratorium go into place and things like that? We, oh, yeah. See, I forgot yeah. about that. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I was like, is this right? Or like the nursing, pushing nursing students through their schooling lots faster. Like, when did that start? When was that, you know, was that state by state? Things like that. Yeah. Wow. Um. So what do you hope that um, readers might take away from the book? I think the biggest thing I hope um, is that we're always better off when we lift each other and support each other. Um, that it really is about community and packs or pods or whatever you want to call them. Um, that and the thing from the title, the title comes from a Mary Oliver poem, um, and the whole line says, it is a serious thing just to be alive on this fresh morning in this broken world. And I want readers to take that away too, because at the beginning of the story, I think all four of these characters were very, well, all three of them were all very in a place of, yeah, I don't know, not seeing the beauty, not thinking it's such a great thing to be alive in this broken world. And then Ren, of course, has her moment later in the book. But they all kind of recognize that, yeah, these are dark and troubled times, but there is always that beauty to be found. Like we get to be here for it. And I think for me, a lot of that comes from the being coming through cancer. I think that changed me. And I and it may sound really Pollyanna-ish, but I'm always like thinking like on the worst days, a day that, you know, I realize I have to replace my car way before I thought I did. Or you have like a thousand dollar vet bill, emergency vet bill or something where I'm like, well, I get to be here for this. I get mm. to be here, right? So these are dark and troubled times. And yet there's beauty to be found. And most of that beauty is in community and coming together. Yeah, mm, very nice. So first, let me just say that that is a really lovely, lovely way of looking at things. And I could stand to look at the world a little bit more that way. I know that um, Katrina said it was a little Pollyanna-ish, but also whenever anyone's, and it's it's not, it's just, it's a different way and a, a lovely way of looking at it. But anytime anyone mentions Pollyanna, I immediately think of the movie with Haley Mills. It, you know, it's it's an older movie. It's from before my time, but I watched it growing up. And the little kid and the way he says Pollyanna, again, I mentioned watching movies with my dad. And the kid, that was something that we would laugh about because he would say it, Pollyanna, <laughs> come out and play. So anytime anybody says the word Pollyanna in my brain, I hear Pollyanna. Yeah, I'm going to go to break so that you don't have to listen to me talk about Pollyanna anymore. Um, we... <laughs> 
When we come back, we are going to be talking about what draws Katrina to writing within the genre in which she writes. So stay tuned. You are watching and listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. For the best and latest podcasts available anywhere, go to the podcast app on your cell phone and type in GSMC to access free content-rich podcasts on health and wellness, book reviews, sports, entertainment, relationships, social media, movies, technology, finance, and even weird news. Subscribe and download the GSMC Podcast Network's family of shows, available everywhere podcasts are found. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Katrina Kittle. Before the break, Katrina was talking about what she hopes readers might take away from the book. Um, she shared some of her views on how she sees the world, even when the world is dark and hard and uncomfortable and all of those things that we don't like sitting in. And um, it was lovely. So thank you again to Katrina for that. Uh, let's go ahead now and return to the interview. Again, the book is called Morning in This Broken World. What draws you to writing within the, the it could be a lot of different genres. There's so many, I love that there's so many different like niche of genres, but let's just call it literary fiction or uh, yeah, let's just call it literary fiction. What draws you to writing within this genre? I think it's, I, I think we mostly, I, most writers I know, or at least this is true of me, I, I try to write what I love to read. And so I, I guess it's what I've been drawn to read. And I think they are just really stories of strong friendships, um, usually about found families. Those are, those are like my favorite go-to things um, that just kind of explore relationships, um, that that's the key of the story. There might be like mysteries, um, there, you know, there's tiny, tiny bit of mystery about Anne Marie, but it's not ever going to be the driving force of the kind of books. I mean, I do love mysteries. I do love thrillers. I read all across the board, but I think the things that I love to read the most are that just really delve into relationships, how we connect to each other, how we fail to connect to each other. Um, and so I guess I'm trying to write those things I love to read myself. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and this is your sixth novel. Uh, do you want to take a moment and highlight any of the others? Sure. I think one of the things they all share in common, this idea of found family, like I mentioned before, interspecies friendships, there are animal characters in every single one of my novels that, um, for some reason, I just think aliens. I don't know why I keep going. Oh, sorry. 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 No, 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 I, mean, no like, I, I think, I think that just says what I read okay. sometimes. <laughs> so there are animal characters in non-human animals who are become just as important as the human cast and all of my stories. And I think all of the stories take you to some dark places. Um, they always kind of center around contemporary issues that were hard like this one has COVID. I've got one that um, kindness of stranger centers around a case of child abuse. The blessings of the animals really looks at divorce um, and marriage and same sex marriage. <laughs> but but um, there's all it, I always there's always redemption and hope at the end of all of the stories. So I may take you to some dark places, but there's always a reason for it. I just don't take you to dark places and leave you there. <laughs> yeah, it's always yeah. my goal. <laughs> um, and we did not talk about the the animal friend in this book. Um, so do you want to say anything about Ox? Sure. Ox. I love him. Um, so there's a big black and white cat who lived in the retirement community where Vivian and Jack were belonged to a, another resident there. And he kind of wanders the halls and, um, is very devoted to his human. And when his human gets COVID and doesn't come back from the hospital, um, he's like, they don't, nobody there knows his, the man's Dennis's kids don't want him and Vivian remembers him and wants to find it. When she finds out that Dennis has passed away, she's like, what happened to the cat? Where's Ox? And she brings Ox home. And, um, and it's, it's like, she's, she's kind of like, she tells the cat and the cat's just bereft. Right. And she talks to the cat and she's like, you know, I've lost somebody too. I know what that feels like. And she just, again, it's that, feeling of like wanting to help somebody else reach out to she's like I know what this feels like he needs somebody he needs us 
And then yeah. he become you know, Ren has always wanted a pet. And, um, but he's this huge, big, fat cat. And um, he, he's pretty fun. And he's kind of based on a cat. When my mom was alive and my parents first moved into that community, there was a resident, not at all like the resident I create, who had this cat. His this cat name was Hootie. And he wasn't a huge, fat cat, but he was black and white. And he would wander the halls and he was very talkative. He would, you know, it's just me always had, you would, you would feel like you had a real conversation with him. Hey, Hootie, how you doing? And he would just meow, 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 meow. And he would, my mom was at that point, not verbal and she would always smile for him. And so mm -hmm. I had a soft spot in my heart for Hootie. And so I just yeah. think animals, animals bring us so much. Yeah. And so I'm and like, there, he needs to be in here. There's just one line where she, when, after Vivian brings him home and he sits like for the first week with his face in the corner, just <laughs> Hard. I mean, this imaginary cat. I just wanted to scoop him up. But... I know. I feel like it's okay. It'll be okay. <laughs> so you've written for a while. It sounds like it's something that you knew you wanted to do. But um, what was that path for you? What led you to decide, yes, I want to try to write for publication? I have always written and I've always been a huge reader. My dad's a chain reader. I tease him about that. He has to know what he's, he's going to read next before he can finish a book. Um, so that heavily influenced me. But I never really thought about writing my own stuff until after undergrad. So I started in dance. I really wanted to be a classical ballerina. <laughs> I studied very seriously. I'm way too tall, way too big. That was never going to be my path. Um, but a wonderful, wonderful mentor there um, at the Dayton Ballet School helped me kind of encourage me to go toward theater. Um, and so I entered undergrad as an ac acting major. And after three years was invited to join an honors tutorial in English. So I always joke about my poor parents, you know, from dance to acting to, to English, you know, one practical pursuit after another, right? <laughs> so like, but it all turned out, but it turns out it was actually a great training for a writer um, I learned incredible discipline from dance, which is so necessary to be a writer. And then acting, and you had a recent guest talk about this as well. Um, the theater training is so helpful and so useful. Character development is really the same, whether you're going to perform it or put it on the page. And the idea of motivation and the focus on dialogue, I think it's all come from my theater training. And then of course, once I went to the English program, studying great books, looking at other people's writing. Um, so all of these things helped feed it, but it wasn't until I had graduated, I was teaching English and theater in high school and a, a story came to me. And like all three of those form, it was always about storytelling, the dance and the theater. Um, a story came to me that I really wanted to tell to put a human face on AIDS. I had lost a lot of friends to AIDS particularly coming from a dance and theater background in that, mm -hmm. in the early nineties, um, that I, for some reason it needed to be a novel. I don't know why. I don't know why I wasn't drawn to write plays. I still have never written a play. And lots of people ask me about that. Like, why, why don't you write plays? Um, for some reason it was a novel. And I, so I just said about, I'm, I'm so grateful for the dance and theater background because those have really strong apprenticeship times that you go through and there's a craft that you learn. And so I knew that I needed to honor this apprenticeship. I needed to learn this craft just because I knew how to write, literally write words didn't mean I knew how to write a story. Um, and so I really set about learning, you know, a dancer, an actor, they take class their whole lives. Um, and so that idea of like, I need to learn this. I don't want to just try to jump in and think I know how to do this. So I started taking classes. Um, I would go to conferences and workshops, uh, read every book I could get my hands on about the craft of fiction. And the most important thing I did was just start to write a draft. And then everything I learned along the way through all the study I was doing was I could apply to this draft instead of when people just want to think about writing in the abstract, you got nothing, right? But as soon as you have a draft, even even if it's deeply flawed, everything you learn, you've got something to apply it to, which I think is a much better way to learn. And then it just, that was it. Like if I felt like all my life I was looking for, it's not dance, it's not really theater. I like it, but that's not it. I love teaching, but that's, the writing was it. It was finally like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is what makes me happiest. Um, and so ever since that first novel, I've always had a novel in the works. Always, always. <laughs> when you mentioned 
um, theater. That, that was my first thought was I, I took one class in undergrad, a, a, a drama class, a theater class, just as a, an elective for fun. Um, cause I'd always, I've done <clears throat> community theater and, and, um, the, it's called Missoula, Ch Montana children. She's Missoula children's theater. I can speak that comes to different <laughs> school. They travel all over the country oh, and yeah, they go yeah. to schools and do plays within a week. And I always did that growing up, et cetera. But so I just wanted to take it for fun. And I remember one assignment that I loved. We had to take our character that we were doing for the, the project and just figure them out, write down everything. And I remember one specific prompt was, what kind of underwear do they wear? You know, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I took that so seriously. And that, I mean, that that's, that's character development. Maybe you don't, totally. maybe you don't know what kind of underwear they all wear, but you know, <laughs> you never, it's all in there probably somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I bet you I could figure that out pretty easily once you yeah. know them. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think a lot of this was already in your your previous answer in terms of what you talked about with your own writing journey, but what advice would you give for aspiring authors? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, that idea of just, you have to learn, honor the apprenticeship, but you go ahead and write. Um, so I love to say this, people who take class from me hear this over and over, but I'm always like, you can make it better later. First, you have to make it exist. The hardest thing we do is to make it exist. Once it exists, you can revise it, you can make it better, you can polish it. But if you're just talking about this book you're going to write someday, you got nothing. Um, and so just putting your butt in a chair and start to, to draft it, you're miles ahead of all these people who say they want to write a book, right? Um, and then just, you know, I think the other thing I would tell people is you've got to really want it and you have to persevere, I've got my little coffee cup. Nevertheless, she persisted. And I always joke that this is the story of a writing life right here. <laughs> like, um, you, because once you get into the point where you're going to pursue publication, that's where the persistence really comes in. Um, and you can't, if this is what you want to do, nobody's going to stop you. You can't let a couple of rejections make you think, well, I guess I shouldn't be doing this. You got to know why you want to write and you will continue to do that keep that writing practice, right? Develop a practice that will serve you through the droughts, right? Because there will always be droughts where you're not getting published or the work is too hard. You're not, the story's not working. So if you develop that writing practice and you always hang on to why are you doing this and you keep that answer clear in your head, then those droughts are much, much easier to get through. Thank you. You know, I always appreciate the advice that authors give when they're on the podcast, but um, for some reason, and she's not the first to say it, but for some reason this time when Katrina said, you know, you have to actually write the book that's in your head um, because it's not going to write itself. That's a massive paraphrase. I apologize for butchering the quote, but um, uh, my, my little brain went, oh yeah, it's not going to write itself. All those story ideas I have in my head are not just going to write themselves, which kind of sucks. I mean... Unless I, because I do not, in fact, live in a fantasy book where there's magic and the novel might actually write the write itself, which also kind of sucks. Does it suck to not live in a fantasy book? Mm, depends on the fantasy novel, right? How many creepy monsters am I fighting and how long am I living off a loaf of bread and a chunk of cheese? And where do they go to the bathroom? All good questions. Uh, it is time for our final break of this episode. When we come back, Katrina will be talking about all the things that she likes to read in her spare time. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. <laughs>
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Katrina was inadvertently calling me out on not writing anything that's in my head, uh, despite having numerous ideas. So good advice. Um, let's go. Uh, you know what? I actually have forgotten this for two segments now. So let me do this, what I should have done in segment two. Give me just one second. I'm going to remind you that if you are a fan of this podcast and would like to in any way help support it, you can do so by going to gsmcpodcast.info and you can leave a tip or a donation and, um, Everything you do helps support the show, whether that's liking, subscribing, commenting, following on social media. But if the this is a step that you would like to take, you can do so at gsmcpodcast.info. And thank you very much in advance for anything you might do. Uh, so now the conclusion of my interview with author Katrina Kittle. You're you're a reader, and you've you've mentioned that you do love literary fiction, but um. When you're when you're reading just for you, not for research or anything else, who are your go to authors and um, your you know other genres? If you read other genres, yeah. Well, my go to author is always always Barbara Kingsolver. I mm. just love her work, and so I bought Demon Copperhead pro- probably. I mean, I know I bought it when it came out. I had it pre ordered, but I only recently started to read it. This is how much I love her. I loved the idea that I have a new Barbara Kingsolver to read and I didn't want to be back in that mode of not having like, so I know I like it's so weird. I know people, you get it, but a lot of people who aren't like avid readers maybe don't get it, but it's like, I just, it was just this lovely thing to know I had to look forward to. And then I couldn't stand it and I had to start reading. So I'm almost done with it. I may actually finish it today and it is just so beautiful and I love it. But as I head toward the end, I'm like slowly eking it out. Um, but I do read across all kinds of different genres. Um, but um, like this past year, it was a discovery for me. He's been writing forever, but I read my first S.A. Cosby book, um, Only the Sinners Bleed, or All the Sinners Bleed, sorry, All the Sinners Bleed. And it just blew me away. And so now I want to read everything he's written. He was another discovery, um, Sean Cosby on uh, NPR, where he was on an in- NPR interview and the minute I got parked, I ordered the book because his interview was just so riveting and interesting. So I listen to a lot of podcasts and get my ideas from a lot of podcasts. So I love it. You guys are just adding to my to be read piles all the time. And I actually made a list just because I, this is the kind of question where like when people ask me this, I always blank out and it sounds like I never read. And then I, yeah, <laughs> so, when, so I'm like, I made myself notes because I'm all over the place. I love Carl Hyacin. And I, I was b- belated to this, but recently read Squeeze Me, which just delighted me. So I just love funnier stuff. Um, sometimes it's really fun to just, you know, escape with that. Um, I, I'm a big lover of Jodi Picoult and her book with Jennifer um, Finney Boylan, Mad Honey, also blew me away recently. And I love, for instance, with that book, if you know anything about Mad Honey, it's got some twists in it that are sort of like six sensey where like, you don't want that spoiled for anyone. And so even though I was kind of late to that party, I didn't know. I, I came into it knowing nothing about it, which I think That's is the impressive. best. Yeah. I didn't know. I kind of had my ideas because of who she co-wrote it with, but I forgot about it as I started writing. Um, Black Cake um, was another book. And Oh, I love Rachel Moulton. Um, she was a friend of mine. She now lives in New Mexico. Her book, The Insatiable Volt Sisters, came out this year. She's known for writing feminist horror. And when I heard that title, I'm like, what does that mean? So she has a previous book called Tenfoil Butterfly. But this this newer one that came out this year, The Insatiable Volt Sisters, was just fabulous. So I love horror, thrillers, mystery. I'll read anything. I just read. <laughs> I, I love how we have so many different genres and subgenres and niche genres and and you oh, know yeah. I know public publishers probably hate it because they want everything to fit into a nice little box but nothing they does do. so the fact yeah. that we can now really drill down into what a, a genre actually is I think is fun yeah yeah um internet presence um so people can learn more about your books and you so website and any social media that you're active on yeah. So my website is just katrinakittle.com. So that's pretty simple. And I do have um, a monthly newsletter there that you can sign up for on any page of that uh, website. And it's um, 
it's free and it's, I think it's pretty fun. And I, mean, I mentioned my happy class, right? So every month there are, there's a list of reasons to be happy. And I'll talk about why we include those. Um, there's pet stories, there's book recommendations. Um, I will never use those addresses for anything else. So sign up if you like the sound of that. And um, I'm on Facebook. I have an author page that's just Katrina Kittle author. Um, and I'm on Instagram at Katrina Kittle. So they're, I'm easy to find. I'm still, a, I'm, I think my account is still on Twitter or X, but I don't use that one anymore. So I, I that kind of, I, I feel like that got ruined for me <laughs> through political stuff. And so I just kind of avoid that space. Or that people on X are angry. <laughs> I know, I know. So I'm like, so I shouldn't have even mentioned it. Instagram, Facebook, website, okay. that's where you'll find me. Perfect. Um, Katrina, is there anything that we have not covered that you wanted to make sure you highlighted or you want to bring up at this point? Yeah, I think just that if you, if anyone's interested in exploring previous books or this one, there's a, there's a quote that I love that I think is the theme and variation on all of everything I write. And it's an Ernest Hemingway quote. And it says, um, the world breaks everyone and afterwards some are strong at the broken places. And I feel like that's what I write about. Not the first part, the world breaks everyone because we all know that happens, right? Sooner or later, it's our turn to get kicked in the teeth by something. But some are strong at the broken places. I think human resilience really fascinates me. And that's the core of all of my books. And if there is if there is one word that kind of is what I'm writing toward for any of them, this book or any of the previous ones, I think it is that idea of resilience. So if you're looking for, you know, some brightness in these dark times, that's my goal in every book. I think that quote also really explains your affinity for Barbara Kingsolver. Um, oh, yes. He does yeah, that absolutely. a lot as well. Yeah. Don't write about people getting broken. I write about people putting themselves back together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, it's early morning for you. So you've got your coffee. I appreciate <laughs> you taking the time to talk to me about the book and writing. Um, thank you so much. And thank you for everything you do. Thank you so much once again to Katrina for joining me to talk about morning in this broken world and writing and so many other things that we talked about. I really appreciate it. As I said at the beginning, I loved this book. I really, really enjoyed reading it. Uh, there were a few things that were a little bit triggering for me. Um, and I, you know, I'm not going to tell you everything about them, but um, just the, the going back to relive the pandemic was one of them, the cancer diagnosis, things like that. Everybody has things that can affect them differently, right? But the fact that it they affected me so deeply uh, really speaks a lot to Katrina's writing. And so if this is a book that you are interested in, you should definitely check it out. Um, if this is something that uh, a reader in your life might be interested in and you are looking for a gift giving opportunity, then definitely check out Morning in This Broken World by Katrina Kittle. Um, as always, I hope that you will join me for my next interview. Let me just go ahead and bring that up so you can see. Um, I will be speaking with Jody Hobbs Hessler about her collection of short stories. What makes you think you're supposed to feel better? I mean, with a title like that, you have to you have to find out what that is about, right? Um, again, it's a collect collection of short stories. I will be speaking with Jody about that collection. I'm looking forward to finding out um, everything that goes into writing a collection of short of short stories uh, in terms of how Jody does it. I've spoken to other people, so uh, join me for the next interview. Again, Jody Hobbs Hessler. What makes you think you're supposed to feel better? It's an excellent question. Uh, thank you, as always, for joining me once again. Let me say, if you are a fan of this podcast uh, and you are on any platform of social media, well, not any platform of social media, but if you're on TikTok, Facebook, X, or Instagram, you can follow the podcast on any of those platforms. Love hearing from readers. Love hearing what you're reading, what's coming up on your TBR, all of those good nosy questions that I enjoy asking and finding out about. So follow the podcast on social media and come find me by extension because it's not under my name, but I will be there answering questions if you have them. <laughs> I hope you're having a really good week, whatever you're doing, if it's busy, if it's quiet, but whatever. Um, I hope the week is off to a great start, but as I always do, I hope that your week involves plenty of time for you to get yourself lost in a good book. 
Thank you so much. Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Damn, ain't that great? I don't wanna go.